everybody. Um, hope you've had a great week. Glad you decided to join us. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are still on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John, the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. And it reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we will continue on our third declaration of freedom. Freedom from discouragement, no frustration, found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. Again, today I'll read verses 26 through 30 out of the NIV version. Starting with verse 26, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And so Paul, in our verses uh, 18 through 30, makes the contrast between suffering of this present time to the future hope of glory. Paul knew suffering, and he had suffered greatly for the sake of the gospel. But when he reflected on his struggles in light of eternity, he saw his struggles, his current struggles, as light and momentary. That's a hard pill for, for the majority of us to swallow. Because when I'm in the midst of my current day struggles, which in reality, of course, can't be compared to the struggles of Paul's day. So compared to Paul, my struggles are, are tiny. But even so, we think of them as struggles. And so when I'm in the thick of it, if I'm honest with myself, I'm not thinking of future glory. I'm not telling myself, hang in there, because when I see Jesus, it will all be worth it. No, for the most part, I go into woe is me. I, I go into a pity mode, which only causes me to be discouraged and frustrated. And Paul is saying, it doesn't have to be so. Paul often uh, compares this Christian walk to an athletic competition. He says that it's important to keep your eyes on the prize. Because when you keep your eyes on the prize, in doing so, it, it, it helps to endure the hardship. I'm not a golf fan, but my husband is a lover of the game. And 
just by hanging around him and him talking to me about the sports as though I know a whole lot about it. But just because he's been talking to me about it, I've learned more about it than I care to know. That said, I've seen Tiger Woods play in what appeared to be uh, obvious, excruciating pain. In fact, some of his most memorable games have been when he's been in the most pain. It is, it's, during those times, it's like he not only played well, but he won the championship. The pain, it, it appeared, had been so intense that after winning, he would have to eventually have hip surgery or knee surgery or some kind of surgeries or back surgeries, or some kind of surgeries he'd have to have. And you have to ask yourself, why did he do it? When he could have just stopped in the middle of the game and left the course, and nobody would have blamed him. It couldn't have been for the money, because hey, he probably has plenty of that. So what was his motivator to keep going? It was the prize, and all that it meant. To keep going, he had to keep his eyes and his mind off the pain and focused on the finish, where the glory would be laid on him. He would get all the accolades and all the, the, the power and everything that came, came with winning. That made the pain small in comparison. And for us, in order to endure, Paul says, we've got to refocus our attention away from the struggle, away from the current pain, and onto the finish line. That's where all the glory happens. That, that's where the crown is received. When you think about it, life is a marathon, not a sprint. It, it requires some endurance. A sprint all a sprint requires is that you just have a fast burst and, and last for a little while. But a marathon it is a slow, steady, uh, it's a long course that requires endurance. And think about it. Like most people, I hate needles. I, I hate getting shots. I hate having blood drawn. I hate anything having to do with a needle being inserted in me. But I've learned that if I don't look, if I take my eyes off the needle, the stick is not nearly as bad. The sting is still there, but I'm not focused on it. Uh, as long as I'm not looking at it, it's usually over before I know it. Paul suffered severely for the sake of the gospel. But when he compared those sufferings with eternal glory, he said that there was no comparison. That, that eternal glory was so fantastic, so glorious, so wonderful that it was no comparison to the current day sufferings that, that he had to endure. Now, he's not acting like the afflictions are not there. They are. They are severe. So much so that his outer person is wasting away. It, it's the, the load is so heavy on him. He, he's looking run down and, and, and tired from constant struggles. But the Holy Spirit, who gives life, is renewing, he says, he's renewing his inner person day by day in preparation for the glory to come. So Paul is encouraging us to shift our focus away from the heaviness of the temporary, eternal, external circumstances. He, he, he wants us to focus toward the internal and the eternal weight of glory that is in, 
that is the inheritance of those who believe. He, he's saying our inheritance, what we're going to inherit, is better than what we're having to endure right now. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Take note that Paul did not say all things are good, nor does he say that all things work together for good for all people. All we would all we have to do is, is, is look around and know that all things don't work together for all people. Everything that happens, uh, everybody don't, don't come out of it good. We see both natural tragedies as well as human cruelties. And everything does not work out for everybody. Paul is saying that in all things, God works. He is at work to accomplish what is good for his people. The great promise is that God will overrule and work through tragedies caused by sin's presence in the world. To accomplish his purposes in the lives of those who love him and who has responded to his call. That does not mean that God always spares his people from tragedies or from illnesses or from other unpleasant circumstances of life, nor does God shield his people from persecutions. But in any of these difficulties, God is working for his people's good. Paul is not promising escape from but hope in spite of. God will accomplish good. God works all things out for those who love him. That should be, and it is a promise of deliverance. And it should be not just an assurance, but a blessed assurance. Of course, that also requires that my mind is transformed so that I can recognize good. That should be a reason to enjoy freedom from discouragement. That should be a reason for us to enjoy freedom from frustration. Let's look at that verse. The words, all things, go beyond just the great events of the world. The tsunamis, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the fires, and all of that kind of stuff. He controls all those things, but God also controls so much more. He rules over all things, not just those things, but he rules all the events and the happenings that happens to me as his child. He rules the, the happenings of my life, big, small, the good, the evil. He, he, he rules the, all of my struggles, all of my pains, all of the tragedies. He is in it all. God is in all things. In all things, God works. He works all things out for good in behalf of his dear children. The King James Version of Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That word, the words work together, is huge. It encompasses a lot. It, 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 um, it means to create and eliminate, to place and replace, to connect and group. It means to interrelate and intermingle, to shape and forge, to press and stretch, to move and operate, to control and guide, 
It means to arrange and influence. It's like a, a, a broadband, which uh, explaining it is above my pay grade. So I went to Webster. Webster says broadband is a high speed, high capacity transmission medium that carries signals from multiple independent network carriers. This is done on a single coaxial or fiber optic cable by establishing different bandwidths, different bandwidth channels. Okay, I'm gonna test you on that, haha. -ha. All you tech techie folk, you get that. To me, it was just a bunch of goober gobble. Uh, so for the rest of us who did not get it, I will use my two senses to kind of break it down in its simplest form, which is how I understand it. One example would be like the World Wide Web. You know, when you go to find something or, or something on the Internet, you may say www, which is World Wide Web. In my mind, this is my simple way of explaining it. And I know for the tech folk, they're like, what? But anyway, this is my simple way. I picture this station of some sort located in the middle of somewhere. And, and from it, millions, trillions, even billions of signals upon signals are branched out that goes all over the world. And they are being connected. They're being grouped together, interrelated, intermingled. They're being shaped and forged, controlled and guided, arranged and, 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 and influenced and the like. And so, so much so that when I Google, anything that comes to my mind, I decide to Google it, all that stuff in the in the World Wide Web, all that stuff comes together to give me the results of my search. Romans 8.28 says, all things work together. All things means all things, everything, big and small, significant and insignificant, work together. That's the broadband. That, that's everything that, that comes, everything comes together. It works together. In that is included something that only God can do. All of the stuff that has ever happened to me or in the world from its existence, God brings all of that into play to be a part of his broadband. All the things work together. He uses all the things, all he uses all to work in his broadband network. So God can go back into the past and, 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 and get stuff and bring it to help me now. The Holy Spirit brings things to my remembrance from way back when. God can use things from wherever to help his children. So the things that are created and eliminated, placed and replaced, connected and grouped, interrelated and intermingled, shaped and forged, pressed and stretched, moved and operated, controlled and guided, arranged and influenced. God uses all things and he can do all things with it. It also means that it is present action. It, it could that verse could read all things are working together, which means that all things are continually working together for the believer's good. God's network continually grows. All stuff continues to ha as stuff continues to happen to his children. God continues to create and eliminate to place and replace connect and group, interrelate and intermingle, shape and forge, press and stretch, move and operate, control and guide, 
arrange and influence. God is always, always doing something. He's shaping things and pressing things and stretching things and moving things and operating things, controlling things, guiding things, arranging things and influencing things. Y'all, God is in control. Don't ever think that just because you can't see it or figure it out, that God is not working it out. God is in the background doing a thousand and one things while we're thinking he's doing nothing. In 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, the king of, of Syria decided to start a war against Israel. He, he would plan his attacks and, and, and then Elijah would tell the king of Israel what the king of Syria's plans were. So, so his plans never came to pass. And, and so the king of Syria is thinking, I got a mole in my, in my, there's a mole somewhere. But, but one of his servants told him, he says, no, nobody's telling anything. The prophet Elijah in, 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 in uh, Israel, he says, he can hear things you whisper in your bedroom. And, and so finally the king gets upset. And he, he's ready to take Eli, Elisha out. And so he sent horses and chariots to surround the city where Elisha was. And, and when the servant of Elisha saw them, he came to Elisha terrified. But Elisha told him in verse 16, he says, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I can imagine that when Elijah said that, the servant looked at him like he was crazy, like, there's nobody but me and you. I guess all the, the city has been surrounded. Because when he looked around, that's all he saw. Through his eyes, he only saw him and Elijah. But Elijah prayed for God to open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and the young man saw. He, he saw that the Lord was in full control. God had been working it out for their good. The king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army to surround the city. But God sent for Elisha. He, he, he had a mountain full of horses and chariots of fire that were stationed all around Elisha. So the point here is that God is in control. Even when we don't see it, even when it appears that God is doing nothing, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is in the midst of everything, working out everything, doing all that's necessary for his people, for all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's it for today. Join us next week or next time as we continue with freedom from discouragement and no frustration. Let us pray. Father, we said thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that even when we don't see it, you are working things out for our good. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Remember, you can always come back and listen to all of the messages on our YouTube channel as often as you like. Um, that is Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis Incorporated. And also remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you will be notified when new messages are available. And also thanks to everybody that left messages last time or, or left comments last time. And we encourage you to Leave comments whenever you want and say hi or I'm listening or something. Um, bye for now. Have a blessed week and please stay safe.